Hello everybody, welcome back to High Fleet Shipbuilding. I'm going to be building a fast tanker in this video, something to pair up with the Audacity and whatever broader ship we end up making so that it can be supported with a fuel tanker without needing to carry its fuel itself. This ship is going to be small, light, very narrowly uh, built for its role. It's not going to have a lot of diversity to it, but it's mainly going to carry fuel and it's going to act as passive sensors. I've got the stats open for the default Skylark and the Audacity on my other screen to make sure that I don't just build the, Sky the Skylark again because uh, there's no point building my own ship if it does exactly the same thing as the old ship. As before, I'm going to lay out the components that I need. The first one is obviously going to be a fuel tank. Um, the fuel tank is an interesting component because it only costs 80 um, credits, but it weighs 450 tons. <laughs> um, sorry, it carries 450 tons of fuel, which masses out of something like 430 tons of weight. Um, the smaller fuel tank costs uh, 40, uh, sorry, it costs 10 credits. So it's actually um, an eighth the price of this, but it only carries 40 tons of fuel. And if you're carrying a lot of fuel, it does work out better just to carry one of these. Probably the big question we've got to ask ourselves is do we want one or two of these? And honestly, after playing around with things, I want to make a really small ship. I'm probably going to take one big fuel tank. I'm going to make the ship as efficient as I can, and it's only there to support a small ship or a couple of ships. And then I want to build another model that has maybe two or three tanks that will act as our aircraft carrier and our missile carrier chassis. Other things I need on this ship, I want at least two D30Ss. These are great, as we mentioned before, for range and um, efficiency. And then I'm going to use some D30s as well on this ship as well. The D30 being the rotational thrust engine that's a lot more efficient than the NK25. This ship doesn't need to react quickly in combat. It needs to get about the map very quickly. You do need to have rotational thrusters on your ships, though, or you can't land them, very, well, you can't land them basically. Um, let's not forget that we will also need legs. Um, although I'm tempted to try and use struts as a landing gear on this ship. We'll see how that goes. And the other important stuff that we're going to need is this ship does have a job to do as a sensor. So we need an elint sensor. There are two available to us, the MP404 and the MP21. To be honest, the MP21, the, the, the advantage of the MP404 is the range on it. So I want to go with a big one. And we also want an IRS-1 Mars, which is our infrared um, search and track radar, sorry, intertrack system that will let us see incoming infrared signals, which is very useful for seeing missiles and finding um, enemy merchant fleets that are flying just off the main path between cities. I've done this quite a few times. It's the IRS scanner that lets me see that. So like I said, I want to keep this quite compact. So what I'm thinking is I might just snug up the um, cockpit here and we'll try and make as much use of these um, corner hull pieces as possible. If you watched my last video, these pieces are the lightest pieces you can place on a ship at the moment in terms of standard hull that can take a component. So it makes, good, it makes sense to me to use them as much as possible where I can to make things still look aesthetically good. Let's just fire these in here. And because of the way that power works in High Fleet, I'm going to need to either put a single hull piece here and here to have power run down to these if I put a generator up here or just get generator to run around. It won't run through this fuel piece. You'll have to make sure you're connected around the outside. Um, I think I'll put a D30 here and a D30 here. We're currently looking at 907 kilometers per hour, which is incredibly fast. That's going to go down once we mount these. Um, I want to put down some hull pieces along the top here. One, just to make sure that power flows along, and two, to give us a basis to build our sensors on. Now, I could put the MP404 here. That gives it a perfect, um, is it? No, yeah, part, this little bit of armor is interfering with the scan range. So we've got 1,500 kilometers of elant on this. I want to try and make sure this isn't obstructed as much as possible, but we do have a problem we're going to run into. The, if I place down the IRST tracker next to it, they will block each other's sensors. And now we only have 1,092 kilometers of range. So we've lost over um, 400 kilometers of range on this sensor by putting this next to it. If I remove this and just place this down again, you can see that unblocked, it is actually slightly blocked there. I think it's okay here. Even there, if we just move it up slightly, we'll just, I'm gonna remove this piece, don't worry. If I put this like this on the block, it's not gonna let me place it. Um, unblock the IRST scanner has a 300 kilometer range. So we just have to find a way to put these on the ship where either they're not blocking each other or the blocking is minimal. Now, one thing you can do is um, main components will block the sensor completely. But if you put in just a normal hull, for instance, if I was to put in a little pillar here, um, it will block it, but not completely. So we've lost, well, we've actually lost about 400 kilometers of range again, just by putting this in place, which is frustrating because I want my ELINT sensor to be as long range as possible. So there's a couple of ways I can address this. Um, one way to address it is if we look at the price of this ship right now, we're looking at 800 kilometers per hour. We're looking at a range of 7,000 kilometers. That is great. So it's actually currently faster than the Audacity and has a greater range than the... Um, 
the Skylark, the consumption on this ship is uh, more than half that. So the consumption on a Skylark is 142 tons per 100,000 so per thousand kilometers. This is currently assisting at 61 tons. Let's just make that a little bit more natural by adding a generator. I think we're probably going to need a big one. Um, we're a little bit over with that, but once we add this, we'll probably be there. We've gone down to 724. That's still really good. I actually want it to be a little bit slower than the Audacity. This is a very compact little ship. Obviously, I haven't got any landing gear on it yet, so we're going to have to tweak this a little bit. But what we really need to do is work out what we're doing here. The main thing to look at, if I just move this engine out of the way, is our price is sitting at 8,420 credits, which is incredibly cheap. Um, each of these sensors is 2,000 each. So what we could do if we wanted... Um, is I could do something like this, and this is just me ballparking. I'm, I'm probably not gonna leave it like this, but I could just add some struts on here, get my IRS-1, and place two of them. That means they're blocked left and right, but you can see that I've got my full 300 kilometer range on these. Um, and that puts our price up to 12,440. So that is one way we could do this. The other thing we could do, if I just get rid of these D30s for a second to demonstrate a point, is I could mount one of these upside down on the ship down here, where it's kind of mirroring this up here, and now I have my full sensor range. And honestly, that doesn't look too bad. I'll just need to maybe move some of my engines around, but I could do something like this. So I could go, we could put a hull piece here and here. We could add our D30s back in. And now we're sitting at, what's this? We've got 673 kilometers per hour, range of 5,972 kilometers. So this has slowed the ship down a lot and we've lost a lot of range on it. But we are looking now at um, full ALINT and IRST range on our passive sensors, which is really important. We could also now be cheeky and actually put our legs in here. And the good news with chassis legs is they don't block your sensors. So I could put this like this and it doesn't affect the range on um, our sensors. Now we're slightly under power at this point, but we could very easily just add in a small generator, say here, that puts us back over power. My biggest concern at this point is we've dropped down to 598 kilometers per hour, um, and we're looking at a range of 5,264. If we compare that to the Skylark, the Skylark has a slightly reduced thrust to weight ratio compared to us, it's sitting at 6.2. The speed of this ship is just slightly faster at 598, the Skylark is 559, and the range is, we're sitting at 5,264 kilometers. The range on the Skylark is 6,866. Now we could try and tweak that a little bit. I'm probably not going to, but we could, for instance, add another two hull pieces here, like this, and then we could put into those another two D30s. And that gets us back up to 751 kilometers per hour. It gets us a massive thrust to weight ratio boost, and it gets our range, unfortunately, our speed at 751, like I said, but our our range is now down to 4,648. We're starting to get into the territory where we would probably need a second fuel tank. So what I'm thinking is if we just remove these, we can just keep the weight as low as possible. I might actually want to get rid of this and this, or is that gonna cut the power off? I could do that as well. That keeps us running in power. That's just pushed our speed up a little bit because we don't need those pieces of hull. Um, I could, if I really wanted to trim stuff off the ship, take those pieces off as well. That pushes our, pushes our speed up a little bit further as well. Um, we're basically in a situation here where this generator is solely powering this um, sensor and then the generator here is powering the rest of the ship. I think everything is fully powered. Yeah, it's all coming around. So our... Um, our power needs are a bit funny because this isn't connected to the rest of the ship, but I don't think it's gonna cause an issue. We've got our full scanning sensor radius here. It, it, it's, a, it's a fuel tanker. It does what I want it to do. It has absolutely no defenses. It has no armor. It has no uh, weapons. It has no fire extinguishers. It has no escape pods, um, but it should never ever get into combat. So it shouldn't need to deal with any of those. So this is the ship that I'm going to be using as my fuel tanker for this campaign. To be honest, I'd actually love to run it without the legs. Um, but I think it's going to need them um, and just 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 I think making sure it's got functional landing gear is an a, a aesthetic limit that I want to give myself in this campaign. But um, I need a name for this ship. Uh, at the moment I'm thinking Starfish, which uh, is, is quite cute. Uh, but if someone has a better name for it, please let me know. I'm going to have a look at some tankers um, in the similar role at this that some players have uh, suggested to us in a second and then we will get working on our next ship which will be our aircraft carrier and our missile carrier lighter ships but the other thing i'm quite happy with the ship before i move on is the price is great at ten thousand credits that's exactly what i want that means an audacity plus this will cost 30 grand and that means we can if we wanted to have 10 pairs and still may well within our budget if we wanted to 
Okay, welcome back to our tanker creation video. In this part, what we're going to do is go through some community suggestions for the tankers to take into the hardwood campaign. I'm pretty happy with the starfish. It's definitely got some interesting design choices to it, but let's see what everyone else has come up with. I really enjoyed doing this with the Audacity comparison ships, and I'm going to try and do this with some other ship types as well. We've got some submissions today from um, Butcher again, Blinky ATX. We've got some from Zero von Kaiser and Trifler, but we also have some from the Demon. So it's nice to have another person put forth some ships to have a look at. I'm going to keep doing this uh, sort of style of video with the design first and then a community snapshot at the end because the ship building in this game is so cool and I want to showcase the kind of stuff people come up with. Uh, I'm pushing to try and get the rest of these videos done this week so that we can get the campaign started next week because I really want to get going with it and it's taken a while to set this stuff up. Apologies for my dog making a noise. It's kind of a thing in my video. Um, so if you want to supply a video, the next one, sorry, not supply a video, supply some ships. The next one that I'm going to be doing is for a missile carrier and a aircraft carrier, small scale ships that could move around really fast and support our fleet. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be doing our gladiator style brawler that's going to be made to take on strike fleets and bigger garrisons. And then finally, we're going to be doing the flagship. So if you have suggestions for those, please let me know. Another thing I want to do after we made our next ship is just work out where our budget is sitting so that we can build to that budget going forward. Uh, the first ship that we're going to have a look at here, though, is the Starling, which is a submission from Butcher. I've put the stats for the uh, Starfish on the right-hand side of the screen there, just so that we can compare them to their submission. So the Starling is a pretty good Skylark-like ship. We've got a really good thrust-to-weight ratio of 8.3. We've got a really high speed of 750 kilometers per hour. You'll notice that the range between it and the Starfish are almost identical. We've got 5300 and 5300. The big difference being that this ship carries more fuel. It just uses more fuel as it travels because it's heavier. Using the single fuel tank is definitely something that I think is a bit controversial in my Starfish build. It may come back to haunt me, but I'm really keen to see how well it does in the campaign. A couple of other things just to quickly talk about with this design. I really like the look of it. I like those big engines at the bottom. It looks like it has a lot of thrust. Um, Butch has also decided that rather than going with an IRS T scanner to actually take um, a tracking radar instead. That's what's on that pylon on the left. And he's raised both the Elant sensor and the tracking radar to try and give them a bit of elevation and also so they're not blocking each other's views. You can see if you look down at the bottom left-hand corner that the tracking and radar distance for that sensor, which is usually I think 200 kilometers per hour, sorry, 200 kilometers per hour, 200 kilometers distance has been just to 187, which with, with such a small range anyway, it's actually a very small fraction of that um, coverage that it has, so it's not really losing out too much on that. This will give the ship the ability to help guide in A100s and other ballistic missiles, which gives it an additional job, and that very high speed means it can stay out the way of enemy fleets and lead them into interesting directions. It's a really nice build. Um, they also put together the Squat, which looks almost like a uh, like a top-down 2D fighter plane um, with all of those engines along the bottom of it. Bottom of it. Again, they've managed to push 700 kilometers per hour out of this and a huge range of 6,800 kilometers, which is insane. Um, the ship also boosts uh, a... This one has um, another radar, the tracking radar. It has the bigger one, which has a 400 kilometer range. And he's got that mounted underneath upside down, like I did on the Starfish, so that it isn't blocked. The other thing that this shape has that my um, Starfish doesn't have, which I quite like, is it actually mounts a radar jammer. So this ship can jet around the place, it can make a lot of noise, it can track down enemy fleets, and it can guide in missiles, because that radar that it's got equipped for it is a tracking radar, which is the important thing that you need to help guide the missiles in. So again, another cool build. I really like the shape of it. It. Um, it definitely gets awkward for me when I'm using two fuel tanks. If I separate them out, I've struggled to place them in the ship, but I think this works really, really well. Um, and looking at costs, I didn't really talk about that. Um, 8,000 more expensive than the Starfish. That's really not very much to worry about at all. It's, it's a really cool ship. Now we're going to move on to the Demon's ships. The Demon has a few different variants that they've added in. This is the Skylark Mark II. This is a slower um, ship because it's more of an upgrade to the Skylark than a new ship entirely. So you can see what they've done is they've um, up mounted the IRST scanner. I look, I think it's on the bottom of the ship there, flipped over next to that escape pod so that it has its full 300 kilometer range. And they've also added a 400 kilometer um, tracking radar on top as well. And that's both to help guide the missiles and also to allow it to use the sprints that they've added onto the ship to shoot down incoming ordnance that's, that's coming at us. The only downside we've got is the Elant has had a little bit of a reduced range, but honestly, in the end of the day, the reduced range on the Elant isn't that much of an issue. Um, a thousand kilometers is still a very long way and more than enough time to react to finding the enemy. Um, we're looking at a range of 5,500 5, kilometers. Again, a great range. 
it's another great refit of the Skylark and I really like the addition of the, um, the anti-air missiles because now the Skylark has an additional job to run in the fleet. It's just a shame that to use these missiles you need to have that tracking radar on the ship because it just makes the build a little bit more complicated to work out but they've done a really good job of making it fit in. The next ship is also one of theirs. This is the Skylark Mark III. This is taking it to a really big extreme in terms of now, they've taken the additional design from the Skylark Mark II. We've got a tracking radar, we've got an IRST scanner underneath, upside down on the ship. But we've added in two additional fuel tanks and they're mainly there to give us the enough fuel. Um, so we've got the same range as before, but now we can mount two A100 missiles as well. And now this ship is an all-in-one missile carrier and refueler and anti-air defense ship, which makes it a very powerful addition to your fleet. Um, the cost for this is 2,500 credits, but I would remind you that the um, A100s cost 1,500 on their own. So just those two missiles have bumped the price up by quite a lot. And I think you wouldn't really factor them in to the price of the ship when you're thinking about it in a, a, a sort of a, a looking at your whole fleet level. I wouldn't factor that in too much. Um, the rest of the ship's looking really, really good. Obviously, it is a Skylark just made faster. Uh, not made faster, but made... Um, a bigger audience while I'm talking all over myself right now but I really like it um, it's got a cool very solid feel to it and it looks like it could really support a fleet quite well they have one more um, ship that they designed and that was more to focus on the 700 kilometer per hour requirement that I had on my, my tanker um, so they've actually done better than I have because they've hit 695 kilometers per hour I only managed to hit 611 so their, their ship is a lot faster than mine we've got the irst scanner we've got the tracking radar we've got the elint we've got the anti-air missiles the main thing they did was they just added more engines and you can see how that is possible the only thing that this ship loses out on a little bit from that is it loses a little bit of range because it's burning up more fuel to get that higher speed but i think that's a trade-off we all are quite happy with when it comes to a fast tanker so thanks for those the demon um, it's nice to see just what you can do with the upgrading a, a good build from vanilla and speaking of upgrading a good vanilla build this is triffler's skylark upgrade package it's from their um, easy ship upgrades guide which is a really great guide i linked it in the last video i'll link it in this one as well lots of really good tips on just making your ships better they fixed a lot of the small issues with the ship involving um just some of the, the reinforcement and hull not being quite correctly placed and, and matched up a couple of things they've made sure it's got the right amount of evac pods and the other thing they've done you'll notice at the top of the ship is rather than go for putting the irst scatter upside down on the ship and suspended downwards they've just added two on top none of these centers are blocking each other and we've got the full 300 kilometer irst detection now although i want to speak about irst just for a couple of seconds i know a lot of people don't really think it like like it that much as a scanner but for me i've actually managed to catch countless trade fleets that have been trying to sneak between cities using irst that i'm really happy to have on at least one ship and that little bit of warning that a missile's about to hit can be the difference between life or death if you manage to split an important ship away from your fleet and get it on the right side so that it doesn't get uh, intercepted. So this is another really nice build. It's it's the vanilla Skylark just taken to the next level. We've got a 6,400 kilometer range, which is insane. Almost 600 kilometers per hour, which is a great speed. Um, and the cost is only 1,100 credits, which is very, very cheap. It's actually only 100 credits more than my Skylark, and sorry, my Starfish, which is pretty impressive. I think this may be from the previous version of the game though. So some of these components are more expensive in the version of the game that I built my ship in, which might explain the price discrepancy because looking at the ship right now, I don't understand how it could be so cheap. Um, and then we've got one more ship to look at. And this is from um, Azura von Kaiser. This is the Leaf Hopper, and this continues Azura's theme of really aesthetically pretty ships. Um, they seem to be able to build functional ships that also look really good. And I really like the way this has come together. They've made excessive use of non-straight um, components to, to give it a more um, sort of molded look. It looks like it's come out of a factory rather than just kind of being bolted together. We've got the elant coverage, we've got the IRST coverage, you can see that it's been put underneath. The only thing I would say maybe is that IRST needs to come one block further down just to prevent that slight, slight um, coverage that it must have because it's been reduced from four, well, it's actually not slight, it's lost quite a lot of range from 400 to 274. But that's the only thing I would say about it. This is a really smart looking ship that I think would look good in any fleet. Um, we've got a top speed of 508 kilometers, which is totally acceptable. 7,000 kilometers of range, which is huge. And it, um, what else we've got to look at? And yeah, it, it's fully crewed. It's got escape pods. It's got all the sensors that it needs. And this is a great starting point or a great addition if you want a nice ship that you can rely on in your fleet. I think this has the longest range out of all of them. 6994, 6491, yeah. Looks like it does have the longest range. So that's pretty impressive. 6890 on the squat, so it's almost there. 
um, 5396 on the Starnix. That's pretty cool. Um, all of these are really excellent takes on the Skylark concept um, of just a fast fleet tanker that a lot of these have additional roles added to them, which is really cool. And I know that I said originally that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have like a standard chassis that I adapt. But after playing around with the missiles and playing around with the carrier, I think I need to have a more focused chassis design just because of A, the weight of a landing strip and B, how much space missile tubes take up. You kind of need to build around them rather than bolt them on. Um, especially when I've tried to build it, they really do look like odd additions and it just looks a lot better when you build a ship around them. So that's everything I wanted to go through on the tanker. We're going to be going ahead with the starfish or if someone has a better name for it, please let me know. I'm not great on the name. And uh, the next video we'll have a look at an aircraft carrier and a missile carrier designed to operate with our strike fleet and detach and do independent operations whilst uh, being able to also act as a you know supply station, maybe some anti-air as well. So thank you so much for watching. I really hope you're enjoying these videos. I'm enjoying making them and I will catch you in the next one. Ciao!